I am fantasy author L. Penelope, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes at an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Friday, June 14th, 2019, and this is episode 18 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So this week's best thing was Rocket Man, the movie. Uh, I had no intention of watching this movie. I had already seen Bohemian Rhapsody and I liked it. And so I was like, eh. And and like Elton John and Queen hold a similar place for me music wise. Like I enjoy the music. I'll sing along on the radio when I hear it. I've never buy an album per se, but um, I think the nostalgia, you know, from the 80s or whatever, <laughs> even though those they started much earlier. But like I came to consciousness of those bands. Well, you know, Elton John, I definitely remember in the 80s. Queen, I don't think I knew anything about until Wayne's World. So I got a text from one of my best friends, Inez Johnson, the author, and she was like, you have to run, don't walk to see Rocket Man. And I'm like, really? She's like, the movie is perfection. She said it was like a cross between a Broadway musical and After Effects. And I was sold at that point because I trust her recommendations. She understands what I like. So the next day, <laughs> I went to see it, which was Sunday. And yeah, I went by myself because my husband was not interested in this movie. And I loved it. I did. I thought that I liked it a lot better than Bohemian Rhapsody, actually, even though they're, you know, their lives of Elton John and um, Freddie Mercury follow similar trajectories, although still different. But like once they become rock stars, they have issues with drugs and um, alcohol and finding deeper, meaningful personal connections. I thought that Rocket Man was just a lot more emotionally honest and kind of heartbreaking. You know, you're sitting there, you're watching it. And because I know story structure, I'm waiting for the black moment because things are going bad. I'm like, oh my gosh, when is he going to hit rock bottom? And at a certain point, I'm like, please hit rock bottom soon because I can't take anymore. But it was also just so like beautifully done. And even though I felt, you know, uh, the pain and the emotion that that they wanted me to feel, I wasn't I wasn't still emotionally destroyed. I was I was ready for the bright spot. I was ready for it to go back up again. Um, and it did. And I really loved the way that it did. You could call that scene cheesy, but it worked for me. And so I would recommend Rockman if you're into Broadway musicals and After Effects. <laughs> and if you enjoyed Bohemian Rhapsody, um, I think you'll like this one too. Still using the music, uh, but in a different way. And it also actually kind of reminds me of, reminds me of something that hasn't come out yet, uh, which is my brother's TV show, which is currently called Mixtape. They're going to change the name. It's going to be on Netflix, I think later this year, early next year. And in, just in a similar way that the characters are going to break out into song, um, but they'll be lip syncing because they don't all sing. My brother doesn't really sing. Um, but the show, his show sounded really interesting to me, but like it could either work really well or not work at all. And so I, I texted him that Rocket Man is a good proof of, proof of concept where you can have this sort of fantastical people just breaking into song in the way that musicals work. But, you know, musicals in 2019, like new things, having a contemporary musical in 2019 where people are breaking into song, I think is a hard sell. So um, I felt that Rockman did it well, and, and I hope my brother's show does it well. I'm super excited for whenever it comes out. I will let you know. Also this week, there was um, I was listening to this podcast. It's called Beyond the Screenplay. It's from the same people who do Lessons from a Screenplay, which is a YouTube channel, and they break down um, films and, and screenplays and, and really do interesting like video essays on on different aspects of storytelling. And I've learned a lot from that channel. And so we turned on the podcast, the episode about Infinity War and Endgame. And I'll link to it in the show notes. And um, there were four people there and they're either screenwriters or editors or some involved in the film industry. And so their perspective as like industry insiders can be a little bit more jaded than your average person because... I've seen Endgame three times in the theater and I would go see it again. I loved it. <laughs> like, I loved it. And I have very few, I, like I hear people's criticisms of it and I take them, but 
for me, it was just so satisfying and such a great completion of of the Marvel universe. And I've seen all of the Marvel films um, at least once, some of them more than once. And, you know, I had different feelings about them, but I'm not a comic book person, though, so I'm not coming at it from that perspective. But I am coming at it from a person who has gone most times on opening night to see most of the Marvel films. And so a lot of the people on the podcast were not. They're not Marvel people or whatever. Um, and so as the conversation evolved, uh, one particular person was like, you know, is this movie for me? Because I haven't either haven't seen all the other ones. I don't remember them. I didn't care about them that much. And the idea that Infinity War and Endgame are movies that require, to a large degree, you have seen and kept up with this whole entire franchise. And the question was asked, is this and I don't know if it was one or both of them, are these even movies? Like, are they evolving storytelling to the point where the traditional are thought about a movie? Do these conform to that? The reason being, like, if you have a movie that requires you to have watched 20 other movies beforehand, is it still a movie? Um, And I thought it was interesting, like... (sighs) You don't have to have seen every one of them. But, for example, if you did not see Ant-Man and the Wasp, then certain things in this movie, I don't know that they're going to make sense. When we first saw it, um, my husband texted his brother. was like, you have to to go and watch Ant-Man and the Wasp because he knew my brother-in-law hadn't seen it. And I do think that it would be better if you had seen that movie all the way to the end to the the post-credit scene in order to understand Endgame. but the idea of like is storytelling evolving into this like more of an experience more of a building on it like these these movies were more like tv shows like a, you know you have episodic serialized television and this was kind of the first case of episodic almost serialized serialized esque movies um and and yeah i'm mean, also thinking about this in terms of endings like okay I only saw Infinity War once in the theater because I left, I was crying, I was bereft, I was like, what did I just watch? Um, and I had, I don't do a lot of like research before I go and like I don't, I'm not t- the type of person who, before I go to see a movie, will follow all of the on set interviews and watch, you know, read articles and watch videos about it. I like to go in kind of knowing nothing. So I had a vague notion when I went to see Infinity War that it was a two part thing. But I hadn't paid that much attention to it. So when it stops, I think there's a good question to be asked. Is Infinity War a movie? Like, is a movie that stops in the middle a a, a movie? Like, obviously, it's a motion picture. But you know what I'm saying? Like, a story. Stories at the very basic platonic, I mean, Plato-esque core is a beginning, middle, and an end. Right? So did that movie have an end? When it's a two-part thing... Um, and the same thing, you know, as I was thinking about their conversation, like the same thing could be said about a trilogy. Like you can't just walk into the Return of the King without having seen Fellowship in Two Towers. Like it's not going to make any sense. So when they split these movies up into multiple parts, you know, the same thing with the end, like um, Deathly Hollows was that the last Harry Potter? You know, they split it into two movies, right? Like it was a huge book, or Twilight, or even Hunger Games. You know, they're splitting these things up for financial reasons. Um, But I still think that's different. I think a two-parter is different than a 22-parter, you know? like, And I'm not going to say that it's not a movie and it's not a story and it's not a complete thing. But um, it's the question is interesting. You know, what makes something complete? Does it have to stand alone? And if it doesn't stand alone, then then is, is storytelling somehow changing? Um, also very relevant to me as I work on my novella, book three, book 3.5 of Earth Singer Chronicles, because these novellas, like I'm wondering, are they complete stories? Like the first one that's out right now is, and it, op- it occupies a very strange place in the series because as it says in the description page, it's called Breath of Dust and Dawn. And it's both a prequel and a sequel to book one of the series, Song of Blood and Stone, in that it it starts out as an ext- extended epilogue, and then basically Jack tells Jasmine a story. So most of the book is the story that happened five years ago, and then it ends in, in the present, as again, as an extended epilogue of book one. 
However, the, set, the next two novellas are more like prequels for the the next books. So 2.5 will be a prequel to 3, and 3.5 is a prequel to 4. And they don't have satisfying endings, I don't think. Like, they end. Like, this, the arc of the story ends. But as far as emotionally, like, you're not going to get that closure until the next book. And that's by design. But I'm also worried about it. Like, n- looking at my experience in Infinity War, um, I'm not necessarily killing everybody at the end of the book. I'm definitely not killing everybody at the end of the book. But um, there's a certain emotionally satisfying conclusion that you're not going to have until you get to the next part. And so that's, I think that's what a good prequel does, at least a short novella style prequel, like what I'm doing. But um, I am also mindful of the fact that it's going to leave people hanging a little bit um, in the way that cliffhangers do and the way that you want people to read the next thing. So you leave them a little bit unsatisfied so they get that the next time. Um, so I think it's worth a listen if you're interested in this type of thing in terms of their conversation. Cause yeah, I just, it sparked a lot of thought for me in, um, in terms of I'm consumed by ending things now, ending the series and how is it going to be? And now ending books. And I'm at the end of the first draft of this novella. I have probably another thousand words to write today and I'll be done with the first fast draft. Um, And it feels terrible. Like I posted on Instagram earlier this week. It's just, you know, I think last week I was up or maybe I was down. I don't know. It goes every few days. It goes up and down. And now I just know I've done a lot of things wrong. I've made a lot of mistakes. All of the planning that I did was very valuable, but like it didn't, it didn't uh, illuminate the big glaring problem that I found like a few days ago as I was nearing 20,000 words on the manuscript, um, which is why I, I, I like to plan and I plan, but I know that I'm not going to know until I get to this process. It happens every time. I feel like it feels new every time, but it's not new. It's the same same thing, different day, right? As I was discovering that something is very wrong in this book that I'm writing, uh, I start doing research. So I finish my sprinting. I get the words. I get the scenes done that I wanted to get done. And then I do a little bit of digging because it started to feel like um, – and I'm trying to think when it was the end of the second act, I guess, somewhere around the crisis point. And I was like, oh, well, this crisis isn't crisis-y enough. Like, it's not big enough. And it goes back to the character's goals not being right. And goals are something that I have always struggled with. When um, when Song of Blood and Stone went to St. Martin's and my editor there did her pass, her editing pass on it, one of the biggest things I had to change was my main character did not have a strong enough and concrete enough goal at the beginning driving her through. So um, that's one of the reasons why the self-published version and the St. Martin's version are so different. And so different, I mean, like I added another goal and a whole nother thing that happens um, and had to move things around and do a big revision because to address this issue that her goal wasn't strong enough. Um, and now I'm seeing it. And, and so Knowing that, moving through the other books, I've tried to become more aware of it and tried to focus on it. And I still have issues. Like, even though I'm working, like, I had a goal. And it took me 20,000 words to realize it wasn't good enough. And so I was doing research, and I um, I knew that um, helping writers become authors.com. What is her name? K.M. Wyland. Cam Weiland's site and her books, I, I like them a lot. And there's always really good stuff there. And so there was a great article about deepening character goals. And um, I wrote some notes about what they should be. So I'll, I'll link that article um, also. But um, they should be specific, small, personal, intrinsic to the plot and theme, self-destructive, and lie-driven. And by lie-driven, it means by the lie the character believes about themselves, that the over the course of the character arc, they discover the truth. And so um, thinking about all of these things, I, I'm, I think I'm going to create a checklist of that so that I can test my goals against these criteria because I knew it had to be personal and, and small enough. So it's like saving the world is a goal, but it's usually not a good goal for most characters because it's not personal enough. But saving my sister, who is at 
you know, risk of dying from this um, antagonist, that's a good specific personal goal. Um, and then you have to figure out how to make it lie driven and relate to the theme and all of the other things. So the goal in this novella for my main character was the start of it, like at its core, it's informed by her backstory and her wound and her lie, but it's not, it's just, it needs tweaking. Like, so I don't have to completely throw it away, but I need to hone it and focus it and say, you know, so I think her goal had been, um, she's a character that has been abandoned by her parents. Or she feels abandoned by her parents and she's been, she's grown up in a place where she's not accepted completely, but she's needed because there's this prophecy that says we need her. So she's sort of um, tolerated, but not embraced. And so her goal is to, to win the respect and admiration, esteem and recognition. Um, there's a list of, of potential goals in the antagonist. No, that's not what it's called. In the negative trait thesaurus that I use and esteem and recognition is one of them. And so, yeah, her goal was to be, on some level, to be accepted, but also to be respected by her peer group and her community, because that's something that had been lacking. And that's an internal goal. And I think that my issue has been, I didn't have a strong enough external goal. So what is she doing to make that happen? And when you don't have that strong external goal, then the character is sort of being pushed around um, and reacting and not being as active as they could be. And that definitely has been happening in my draft. So I have to go back to explore, okay, if that's the internal goal. Um, how does that inform the external goal? And then considering that this, this book doesn't have an ending where her arc is completed because that happens in the next book, then um, how does the arc go like where does it end um and i decided that there was not a, another article i read about the four types of endings and i'll see if i can find that link but um i decided that you know so a character has a goal and by the end they'll either meet their goal or they won't and that'll be a good thing or it won't be so in the four times of endings it's like you know happy ending they meet their goal and it's a good thing a tragedy they don't meet their goal and it's a bad thing um, a tragic comedy is they don't meet the goal, but it's a good thing. And then a common tragedy is that they achieve their goal, but it's a bad thing. And I want her to achieve her goal, but it's a bad thing, kind of. And then so that by the time we meet her in the next book, it becomes um, a, um, she's searching for redemption, which is a big theme in the series. And I think um, in some of the, it's for some of the characters and, and this character especially. So yeah, those are things that I'm going to have to think about. And now I have to think about what to do next after I finish this draft, because I did not intend to revise this right now. Um, a, I have to work on book four. It's June right now. And I need to get a fast draft. I really need a fast draft by the end of July. And that's the goal. B, I have another novella that I have to revise before because this is book 3.5. Novella 2.5 has a fast draft, but not a revision. And that comes out first, obviously. And I'm sure there's a C, but I, I've forgotten it. Um, so I think the next step is to really flesh out a detailed outline based on the things that I've discovered while drafting, but not do the actual revision yet. And just write down everything I know so that I've made the decisions that I need to know before I go into book four. Um, and it just is all that is left is for me to go through and revise it and write them down. I can probably do more deep character work now that I've, I know the character better after the draft. And um, I think that's going to be my plan. So that is the writing update. Um, in reading, I am currently reading My Soul to Keep by Tanana Reeve Du, which I'm rereading it. I read it years ago. And because I'm going to be on a panel at ReaderCon in July, sort of honoring her and her works, so I'm rereading a bunch of her books. And 
I'm just loving it all over again. Like it's been so long that I I knew that I loved it, but I didn't know why and I forgot everything about it. Um, and it's funny the things that I remember, like I remember certain plot points, but I have a very vague notion of what's going to happen, but um, it's still surprising. And her writing is just really great. Um, really, really great. I have a problem personally at writing descriptions. Like I don't like to read descriptions either. I generally skim them. If someone, in a, if a character walks into a room and describes it, I'm skimming. Like I don't care what the room looks like unless it's going to be very important to the plot. And what the the room the room's description being important to the plot is almost never happens, you know. So um, there's very rarely do I have to go back and reread because I've actually missed something. Descriptions are boring to me. I I do them later on in the process, and I don't spend a lot of time describing most things unless I think they are important or the character needs to think they're important, which is I think how it's supposed to happen. My point is that Tanana Reeves do descriptions. I do not skim. Um, and she has such she creates such a sense of place that is really, really inspiring and and makes sense and works for the story. And even the pace of the story, even though it's not super fast paced, it's not slow. It's kind of like that just right, that, you know, middle bear, <laughs> just right. Um, so I'm really enjoying rereading this book and I think I'm learning something from it. <sighs> Another person whose descriptions worked for me really well was N.K. Jemison in the fifth season. And that just led me to wonder, is it cultural? Is it like something about Black American women writers? Um, and I don't know. Those are the only two things I can think of right now. Because for me, yeah, most of the time, there's some authors who I have to skim. The, the content of the story pulled me through, but I do have to skim most of the inner monologue and the descriptions. Um, and like, if, if, if you describe what a character is wearing, it should matter. And the, people have different opinions about this. Like there's a writer in um, my chapter of, of RWA who who believes that um, if you don't describe the character, she's just going to assume that they're naked. Like if you don't describe what they're wearing. And I, I disagree. Like if someone is in a book, the description of what they're wearing is almost meaningless to me. And I, I, I think it's a perception issue for me too. Just, I have a hard time visualizing when you're describing a room. Um, it takes me a long time. I'm building the room in my mind and it takes me away and out of the story that I have to do this unless it's very important. So I, I want to skim it. And somehow with Tanana Reeve Du and N.K. Jemison, when they are describing the room, I can build it in my mind or at least enough of it so that I, I don't feel taken out of the story because I have to do so much architecture work, you know, construction. And, um, but I still, I still feel it. So, I just think that's interesting and um, something to study. I don't like, I don't generally analyze as I read, but um, I'm not an analytical, I have to really work hard to be analytical about things that I'm reading or consuming because I do default to just being a consumer of it. Um, and there's times when I want to. So on, the, on it's good because I don't, a lot of writers are like, oh, when they read now, it's kind of ruined because they're breaking it down. That's not usually the case for me. Um, when something is bad, yes, but in a in an average to good book, then it's not usually the case for me because I don't think I'm by default analytical. Um, but I do notice things that, in comparison to other other books that I read, when it works for me. And um, the one of the best compliments anyone ever gave me about my book was that, oh, you, you skipped all the boring parts. And I was like, ah, that's exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to skip the boring parts. Conversely, there are some readers who are like, there's not enough description in this book. And it's perfectly valid. If you like description, there's probably not enough of it in my books. But if you are like me and you skim it, then it might be just right. <laughs> so yes, that is what I'm doing. Goals for next week. Um, figure out my goals for next week. Do some more character work. Do a more detailed outline of, of the novella. And then work on the detailed outline for book four, which this whole process was moving towards so that I can be drafting book four very soon. <laughs> I'm gonna have to readjust the schedule again, which always happens, but it's never what I want to have happen. So that's it for me for this week. I um, Father's Day, oh, by the time this comes out, Father's Day will have happened. So happy Father's Day to the fathers out there and have a wonderful week. Happy readings. For episode show notes and to learn more about me and my books, 
go to lpenelope.com. Subscribe to My Imaginary Friends wherever you get your podcasts, and check out the video episodes on YouTube. Please leave a rating and review to help support the show.